Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm pleased to introduce Lana Yarosh uh, from Georgia Tech. Uh, Lana's been working with Gregory Abad there, finishing up her PhD, and she's um, here as a candidate, giving candidate talk for a postdoctoral research position. Uh, AJ and I had the pleasure of working with Lana a couple of years ago, um, where we connected kids uh, with video conferencing, and Lana has probably does, done more work um, than anybody building and deploying uh, video, pre video conferencing telepresence systems um, with kids and family environments. Um, so I will let her share her work with you. Wow, that was a great introduction. Thank you. Um, so yes, my name is Lana, and I'm going to be talking to you mostly about the Share Table, which is a system for supporting communication in separated families. Um, so I'm currently a PhD student at Georgia Tech. I'm almost done. Ooh, this is like really washed out. I wonder if there's anything we can do about that. But um, uh, my background is in computer science and psychology and in industrial design, and I think you'll be able to see how all these fields kind of combine in my work. Uh, so I've, I've done a bunch of stuff in the past. I'm really only going to be talking today about supporting parent-child communication, but if you can read them, there's a bunch of other topics. So if you want to ask me about these at other times, feel free, and I'll, I'll let you know what else I've been doing. Um, so I'll start off by giving a quick overview of the problem space and a bit of background to provide some context for my research. I'll talk about two studies that I've done uh, that focus on understanding the needs of parents and children in separated families. I'll talk about the system called the Share Table that I created to address the challenges faced by these families. And I'll give a bit of an idea of future directions that my work can take. Okay, so here's how parent-child separation uh, due to work is portrayed in the media right now. This is an Oreo commercial. So we solve parent-child separation, right? Um, well, does this actually happen in real life? Um, I'll come back to this scenario later and fill in some of the blanks here. So why is it even important to support parent -child, and parents and children in interacting remotely? Uh, so these are just some statistics to give you an understanding of the potential impact of this work. As a result of many factors, primarily divorce, about 30% of children in the United States don't live with both of their parents. And uh, in fact, a significant portion of these children live in a different city from one of their parents, which makes continued contact fairly difficult. And even families that aren't living apart, um, parents are spending less time in playing with their children. And since most families live away from the grandparents nowadays, it really isn't that kind of one-on-one -on -one child to adult interaction that's going on. It's becoming more and more rare. And all in all, this is problematic because time together with a caring adult is um, a significant predictor of a bunch of awesome outcomes for kids like mm -hmm. academic success, emotional well-being, social, even physical well-being. All these areas are affected uh, by having contact uh, with caring adults. So this is the depressing stuff. And I just kind of wanted to get this out of the way because the rest of my talk is really about hope for the future. So the good news is that communication technologies can allow us to reclaim some of that important parenting time by increasing opportunities to interact, interact potentially, um, especially over distance. So this is, this is a photo from a New York Times article, and um, it's, it's an article about commuter families, families where one parent spends the week away um, and comes home only over the weekend. And here a dad is reading a book to his kids over Skype, right? Um, so this should be great news. We've been working on communication technologies, well, for the office since before I was born. Um, so we should have this figured out by now, right? Communication, we should have it figured out. Um, well, it's actually not that simple. Um, there's a, a lot of differences between communication technologies for work and trying to parent over distance. The parent-child relationship is different from other relationships uh, because it's characterized by asymmetry. So usually the parent provides care and guidance for the child, um, but not vice versa. And uh, frequently the motivation to interact is different for parents and children. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Second, when you're dealing with children, um, there's a whole different set of challenges from dealing with adults. Um, they need help understanding what the separation means. They need help understanding how to deal with it. And frequently, they just need kind of logistical help in setting up the means that they might have for communicating. 
Lastly, for grown-ups, conversation is a good way to stay in touch, but that's not really the way to engage children. Um, children build closeness through care and play activities with significant adults in their life, and that's very different from other types of relationships. And finally, there's just the idea of putting technology in the home, which introduces its own set of challenges. Um, so you, for example, you can't rely on the kind of internet connectivity that you may get in the workplace. Um, you need the technology to be quite robust because you're dealing with a whole new set of challenges. So now you have like cats chewing on your cords and three-year-olds trying to climb your system like a mountain. That's very different from the office space, usually. And um, lastly, the home is a very personal space. So now you have all these privacy concerns that you might not have in the workplace. Okay. So this is the work that's been done in HCI for developing technology to connect parents, to connect family, uh, connect fam for family communication. So I don't actually expect you to like read all this, but um, I just want to point out a few things. So asynchronous communication is fairly well explored. Like we've been working in this space for a while. Um, and most common topics focus on things like sharing photos, written notes, and calendars. Um, but synchronous communication um, has only come into focus more recently, and in fact, like the papers that are highlighted in orange, and I'm sorry, I'm sure this is very washed out, you can't really see it, but you can see the general number of papers, I guess. Um, um, I don't know what's set up on my laptop. I can see it. Um, do, you know how to, do you know how to fix it? It's coming through fine on the recording. It's just the projector. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, so projectors are hard, and we'll get to that later on in the talk. <laughs> but the, the papers that are highlighted in orange are, is all stuff that's been published in the last two years. So as you see, this is kind of like, I like to call it the forefront of a zeitgeist, so I think it's a good place to be. Okay, so now let's launch into what I've actually done. Um, I'll roughly follow the same sequence in this presentation that I use as a researcher. Um, I go into a space, I conduct formative investigations to understand what are some of the problems that I may address in this space. I design and I evaluate to see whether my approach was successful or not. So I'll start out by talking about parent-child contact and families that are separated by work travel. And I figured that some people in this room might identify with that topic because you're researchers and researchers travel a lot. Okay, so um, to find out what happens when families are separated by work, um, I conducted hour-long interviews with parents and children um, where at least one parent spends a lot of time traveling. Um, and so I'm not sure if you can see it very well here, but um, the table is classified by color based on the kind of work that the parent does. So the bottom four here are, or oh, I have a pointer, hold on, there. The bottom four here are um, academic travel, then we have four here that are military travel and military deployment, and then the top ones here are all business travel. Um, and so. Uh, it's kind of classified by frequent separation versus long-term separation. So frequent separation is more than five nights a month apart, and long-term separation is spending more than two months sort of consecutively apart. And the actual reasons for separation included lots of things like deployment training, immigration, sabbaticals, conference travel, and more. Um, first, I was interested in how parents and children responded to the separation. Um, and it actually turned out that their responses are quite different. Um, and you know, here I'm talking in general. Um, if you read the paper, you can find example, um, exceptions to these rules as well, but this is what generally parents place emphasis on. They usually place emphasis on remaining an active part of the child's life while they are away. Um, so to do so, they tended to be proactive about initiating synchronous and asynchronous contact with the child, such as calling home every day. And when I asked parents for the advice that they would give to other parents who travel for work, they said things similar to, I guess just try and let your kids know that you're still there. You're still a part of their lives, that you haven't really gone, not to worry about you. When they do try to talk remotely, parents try to stay an active part in the child's life and talk about daily events. So for example, they might ask about how school is going and try to suggest strategies for studying for a test. This is actually very different from children. So children, rather than thinking about separation, try to choose to focus on other activities, spend time with co-located adults uh, who are around, or think about what will happen once the parent returns. So when I asked the kids for advice they would give to other children whose parents travel for work, they said things like, you should spend time with your mom when your dad's away, and spend time with your dad when your mom's away. Or maybe try not to think about that. Try to think about other stuff. Sometimes like watching TV gets my mind off of it. So basically the takeaway here is that children and grown-ups deal with separation differently. For the majority of families that we talk to, when you design a direct communication technology, you are implicitly meeting the, um, supporting the desires of the typical parent over the desires of the typical child. 
Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't build direct communication technologies for families. I'm just saying that it's important to consider what might happen when you introduce obligations to communicate that the child may not be willing to meet or when the parent's expectations for the communication are not met. Just something to think about. So additionally, I looked at strategies that these families had for staying in touch, as well as the problematic aspects of these strategies. And I'll just give a brief overview here. Um, there's kind of a typical way in which remote contact happens. So typically, the remote parent calls the co-located parent, or maybe they Skype the co-located parent. And once they talk, the phone is passed around, or the kids are brought in, um, and the other members in the household get a chance to talk as well. It's usually scheduled, and it's usually scheduled by the remote parent. Now, the main challenge of this approach is that it's not always easy to get kids to want to talk on a schedule. Um, so it frequently kind of feels like pulling teeth and getting one-word answers. Um, second, uh, most parents supplemented calling or Skyping with spontaneous asynchronous communication, like sending mail, sending packages, text messages, and email. These communications were usually direct, uh, directly between the parent and the child, and that's what made them so special to the child, just getting something with your name on it in the mail when you're a kid kind of is really important. Um, they, most of these messages were also phatic in nature. So they were not about sharing information, but more about conveying emotion. So one eight-year-old girl described her emails to her mom, and she said, I always use big letters and say I love you. They take up like half of the page. I used to make these little smiley faces, and I put them on there, then I'd put on like a little background. So it's about emotion, not about the information in the email. Uh, the main problem with this strategy is that there's actually very few uh, systems for asynchronous communication with young children. They don't often have phones, and... Um, Frequently not email either, and mail is kind of painfully slow. Now, the best tool in the toolbox of the remote parent is the local adult, the adult that's still with the child. They act as this awesome awareness system, so they let you know what's going on in the life of the child while you're gone. They're also a cheerleader motivating the child to connect with the parent because we know that that's not typically how children um, deal with separation. And then we have video chat, which is kind of hailed as like the savior of all um, remote communication. Well, we found that out of the families we interviewed, only five out of the 14 families used it regularly. Um, first, this is because for many families, especially military ones, the infrastructure was simply not available. Um, there was simply not high enough bandwidth to use that when they were deployed. And second, this was, it was because video chat required two somewhat tech-savvy adults um, to set up the connection, and many families just didn't have that, so it was easier to stick with the phone. And only two of the families we talked to played online games together as a way of staying in touch. Um, to me, this was surprisingly few because I thought this might be a good way of engaging kids. But then I considered what the online games are actually like. So if we're talking about casual online games like Yahoo Checkers or something like that, um, you can't see the other person. You can't see what they're looking at. You can't see what they're doing with, with their mouse. Um, and this actually makes it really hard to motivate the game for the child because children don't just want to play games with their parents because they like games. They like playing games with their parents because parents make funny faces when they make a bad roll, or they let them win, or they do all these other things. Um, and you can't really do that with the um, casual online games right now. Okay, so as I promised, let's return to the Oreo commercial from the beginning. So it turns out, in fact, that these kinds of playful activities over video chat can happen for families, at least for the five out of the 14 families that use video chat regularly. But I think there's a lot missing from the video, so let's fill in some of the details. Okay, so... Obviously, it's the other parent that has to set up the video chat. And of course, it's problematic. So in this case, it requires scheduling ahead of time and a few attempts at connecting it before the video and audio and everything works. The majority of the interaction is actually between the parents. So here, the mom lets the traveling dad know kind of details of the son's life and general day-to-day -day activities. OK, now, finally, mom goes to get the kid. Of course, he's dealing with the separation in the way the kids deal with the separation. Um, he's playing video games to distract himself. And of course, eventually, mom convinces him to go talk to his dad, but you know, it does require that kind of cheerleading work. So the conversation starts, and the dad attempts to get some details about what the mom was saying. You know, how was school? And this is the classic interaction. What did you do in school yesterday? Nothing. Um, and the dad continues to ask questions, hoping to get more than a single word response, but it's kind of awkward. Okay, finally, it's time to say goodbye, and so they end with their cute tradition of eating an Oreo cookie together. So that is very creative, and it's cute, but of course there was a lot missing from that video. There was a lot more work that went into that interaction than the Oreo commercial showed. Okay, so now that I've made a huge deal about the role of the co-located parent in remote parent-child interaction, what happens when that's not there? What happens in divorced families? 
So to learn, to learn more about the needs of divorced families, I conducted in-depth interviews with members of 10 divorced families. We interviewed children, residential, and non-residential parents. Um, and I tried to recruit for a variety of visitation structures and arrangements, and custody arrangements. I also did drawing exercises. Oh, man, you really can't see those at all. Okay, well, I won't talk about them. Then. I, can t I can show you the drawing exercises later. How about that? Um, Okay, so I wanted to know about the communication goals of each of the family members. Um, so here's a quick overview of the findings. Uh, the goals that are highlighted in orange might be attention with the other goals. Um, so first I want to point out that the major things that the parents and children have in common is that they want to interact by doing stuff together. They want to play games, they want to do daily routines like eating dinner together or bedtime. Um, and just, you know, in general doing stuff together rather than nobody said we just want to sit across from each other and talk. Um, we found that both the residential and the non-residential parents actually had the same goals, but they may disagree on how to achieve those goals. Uh, they both wanted to have the necessary information and power to act in the child's best interest, and they both wanted to maintain a strong emotional connection with the child. But this was actually really hard for the um, non-residential parent. Um, we also noticed that it seemed to be important to both parents to minimize the tension between households. Um, so mostly, uh, the way they did this is by accepting this kind of mom's house, mom's rules, dad's house, dad's rules arrangement. Um, and also this led to most of the contact being scheduled so as not to interrupt the routines of the other household. Now this may be a problem because what we know about children is that they're kind of in the moment creatures. They want attention or support in the moment um, and by the time the scheduled contact occurs they may have already forgotten what they wanted to share. Now one of the things that surprised us in the study was that the children were much more sensitive to the tension between their parents than their parents thought. So I talked to one of the moms, I asked her, you know, is your son aware of all this tension that's going on between you and your ex? And she's like, no, we never even talk in front of him. So if I'm talking on the phone, I'm always in a different room, we never raise our voices in front of him, I don't, I don't, I don't think he knows. And this is what the boy said. My mom has a way to make her voice sound like she doesn't care, but at the same time you know it's not true and it really hurts to hear that voice. And whenever I want to call my dad, she always uses it saying, oh, so you're calling him? So this leads some children to keep contact with one parent as private from the other parent as possible. They're really aware of that competition over their time and affection. I also talked about uh, technology use with these families. And the telephone was still the primary way for the families to stay in touch, but both parents and children seemed to dislike it. It was hard to keep the child engaged and find topics to talk about. Short calls were common. And several parents described the exchange of how's it going good, what's going on, nothing. That seemed to be the typical conversation. The telephone is extra difficult for young children who are still developing the communicational competencies to understand the finer points of language, like irony, humor, fantasy. In person, they're aided with, by visual cues, but over the phone, th things get more difficult. As one parent described, you can't really even joke with him unless you say, I'm kidding, or I got a good one for you. A lot is lost. And so then we have video conferencing, but it's still a long way off from being used routinely. Um, one problem is that the system is still too complex for children to use on their own, so it usually requires them to get help. But it's really awkward to go to mom and ask her to connect you with dad. That's what we found from the interviews. Um, so if video conferencing is set up, it's usually for a special occasion. The parents set it up and then the, the kid you know, can use it at that point. Uh, if, so basically any video conferencing sessions that we saw in these interviews, they were always in, uh, scheduled ahead of time and we never heard of one being initiated by a child. However, both of... Uh, so uh, the, uh, the children that I interviewed were always between the ages of 7 and 11. I think in this interview study we had one as old as 14 though. Um, but they also had younger siblings frequently, so we could sort of get the parents' view on how it worked with the younger children. Okay, so is they're getting 12, 13, 14, they're Skyping with each other, and it's becoming a lot easier for them to yeah. start doing some of these things. Yeah, I have witnessed, I have, so I think once the, once the child is around 13 or 14, that definitely happens. Um, but I think there's still this issue where sometimes the Skype is like on a family computer, and it's still something that's kind of awkward for the child to do without what they feel like is a permission from the other parent. Why do you think like time requires scheduling? If the other party is there, you make a Skype call, you make a phone call. That's what I do. Well, because most of these families did not keep a computer with Skype logged in at all times. So oh. usually Skype was something that they turn on when they were about to make a call. Uh, I think we yeah. often make the, mistakes to, the mistake to assume that people keep their computers on at all times. Most people, in fact, turn them off. Uh, I see. Yeah. Okay, don't use Yeah, that's what we found as well. Yeah. yeah. However, both um, video conferencing 
and phones suffer from the same common problem. It's that sitting and talking um, is just not the common way or the natural way for parents and children to um, interact. So many parents complained that talks on the phone and video were short. Well, this is not surprising, as even in person, children spend less than one hour a week participating in household conversations. This is from time studies with co-located family, family members. So it doesn't really make um, any sense to expect them to spend more time being engaged with somebody who doesn't live with them. At what age does that begin? At what age do they start having more conversations? Uh -huh. I think the time study was, like, the one I saw was just, like, children under, uh, under 11, I believe. You know, let me, if, if you want to shoot me an email question, I can actually give you the time study. I think that might give you a bit more um, detail on that. All right. Um, so it's problematic right now. So basically, remember the five strategies that I had for work-separated families? I mean, it's hard enough for work-separated families, but it's even more challenges for divorced families. So yeah, you get scheduled synchronous contact, but you don't really get it with the entire household. You kind of get it with the kid only, and you don't have the other parent acting as this awesome awareness system. You don't have them acting as a cheerleader frequently. Um, if you do get asynchronous static communication, well, some families kind of are more open to spontaneous stuff, but usually custody agreements frown on anything spontaneous. You want to have everything laid out sort of ahead of time. Um, you may use video chat together, but, or, and you may play video games online, but without another adult there to help set that all up on the other side, it's probably not happening. So it's extra problematic for divorced families. Um, and that's kind of why I wanted to focus more on divorced families in my work. I see that there's more potential for impact here. Okay, so now we'll get to the share table system. I'll talk a little bit about the design process, a bit about the implementation, and basically as much as I can fit into the remaining time about the evaluation. So I wasn't going to try to solve all the challenges with one system, but I identified what seemed to be the most important issues um, for a communication system for divorced families. So it should provide visual channels for communication, not just audio. It should be really easy to initiate so the children can do it spontaneously and without having to ask an adult for help. And most importantly, the system should provide parents and children with ways of doing stuff together rather than just talking. Um, so one of the things I acquired in grad school is training in industrial design. So this frequently mean, means that I think through sketches, none of which you can actually see here. Um, I, well, all of which I can show to you later. How about that? Um, and uh, the final system didn't really like pop into my head fully formed, but rather this was an outcome of several cycles of generating ideas, getting feedback from families. And these are some of the sketches from that process. But Oh, maybe. Oh, almost. You can see. It's, it's just enough to entice you to ask me for them later. Okay. Um, so the final outcome of all this work is the share table system, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so basically, the parent and the child each have a share table in their home. The tables connect via broadband, um, and the system presents a dedicated connection, so it's as easy to turn on as a phone. Basically, if you want to start a conversation, you open the set of cabinet doors, and it calls the other table. It rings on the other side like a phone would. If somebody opens on the other side, the connection is initiated. Um, to end the connection, you just close the set of cabinet doors. That's it. There's no mouse, keyboard, buttons, anything like that. Um, the monitor is basically your face-to-face -face video, so that's where you see the other person. It's just full-screen video conferencing, and, that's, and you can hear them through the speakers. Um, but the tabletop provides a um, shared space for activities. So basically, there's a camera and a projector above the table. Anything that you do over the table surface is captured by the camera, sent to the other table, and projected on top. And the two projections are aligned so that if I put my paper board game down on my side of the table, you can see it on your side, projected along with things like my hand. Um, as long as we both have something to use as tokens and dice, if, once you put your tokens on the right spot on the projected board game, they appear projected in the right space on my board game. Um, so let me give a quick video of how this would look if we were using it. So my table rings, and I open the doors to initiate the connection. Um, it starts up, and I say hi to my friend Sonica. Okay. Please excuse our amateurish camera work. You know, we do, we do our best. But, um, so I put a book on my side of the table. And uh, again, this is not like a special book. It's just a regular book. And uh, now it's visible on the other side of the table. Additionally, um, if we want to do something like draw together, that's really easy. You just use dry erase markers on the surface of the table. Now, you may notice that the frame rate of the table surface is not great. We really prioritize the resolution of the table surface over the frame rate um, because, well, usually things that you put on the table don't necessarily move that much, but it's pretty important to be able to see it if there's small font. So I drew my fish, and now my friend Sonica can contribute by drawing on her side of the table as well, and I can see it on mine. So that's basically how it works. 
So the idea of the shared table is actually really simple, but there are a lot of technical challenges that needed to be solved to actually get this to work. <laughs> I won't talk about all of these, but um, I, I'd be glad to answer any questions about them. This is basically just to highlight that I have skills as a maker, and this doesn't even include the carpentry. So the carpentry was a big part of this project as well. Um, I started out by running a lab-based evaluation of the shared table with seven parent-child pairs. Uh, basically, they did a variety of tasks, such as a worksheet together, playing a board game together. Uh, this was to allow us to compare the share table with just video conferencing. And I'm not going to talk about all these results in detail, but basically, it was, it was encouraging. It showed us that parents and kids really got the system and could use it, and so it led us to actually try to deploy it in the home. Um, so we put the system in the home of uh, divorced families in the Atlanta area. Um, and I really wanted to highlight how the share table was different from their previous practices. So we did a two-week pre-deployment part of the study uh, where we asked them to keep um, communication diaries anytime they communicated remotely. We also asked them to fill out two validated questionnaires so that we compare, could compare relationships before and after the use of the system as well as compare the different technologies. And uh, while they, then, then the system was deployed for four weeks and while it was deployed they kept um, a similar documentation uh, process so they kept uh, communication diaries and we kept doing weekly interviews with them. But we also collected sort of text logs of system use and also video logs of whenever the system was in use. So this is an example of what the communication diaries looked like. Um, so the kids basically had one where they could just circle something or draw something. And um, this is an example of why it was important to also interview because if I hadn't interviewed, I would have never known that this says excited. Um, it's a creative way of spelling it. Uh, the parents basically could just write on, uh, on a piece of paper. And I was looking for, you know, when you talked, what, did you, what medium did you use to talk? How did you feel after talking? What did you talk about? That kind of information. Additionally, as sort of like a brief side note, I, mean, I mentioned that we used the validated questionnaire to evaluate um, certain aspects of the system. So developing and validating que this questionnaire was one um, of the contributions of my thesis work. I'm not going to go into too much depth about it, but um, basically the ABCCT um, that's the questionnaire. It measures the emotional benefits and the emotional costs of a communication technology. So emotional benefits might include something like opportunity to provide social support, and emotional costs might include something like introducing unwanted obligations to communicate. So I validated this questionnaire with both adults and children, um, and if you want to use it, it's freely available, so just let me know. Okay, so let's talk about my participants. Usually this is really easy slide in the talking participants, but this is kind of complicated, so I'll try to go slow. So in family set one, we had Matt and Nadia who were married, um, and they had a kid named Simon, Simon who was seven at the time of the study, and then they got divorced and they live in different houses. Uh, Matt remarried to Mary, who already had a three-year-old son named Jeffrey, and Nadia remarried to Rod. Okay. And by the end of the study, Simon actually also got um, a half-brother but we didn't actually interact with the baby, so he's, he's not on the picture. Okay, in the second family, we have David and Kelly, who were married and had two kids. They had Taylor and Kennedy. So Taylor is a boy and he's 11, and Kennedy is a girl and she's seven years old at the time of the study. Uh, they got divorced, um, and Taylor usually lives with his dad. Kennedy usually lives with her mom. The kids spend all the weekends together, so basically there's always somebody getting shuttled every weekend. It's just a question of which parent gets them both on that particular weekend. Um, David also has another girl named Casey who's two from another relationship. And um, Casey doesn't live like alone, so don't, don't call like Child Protective Services. It's just we never interacted with Casey's mom, so she's not on the slide. But she lives in a different house, and he sees her every other weekend. And um, Kelly uh, remarried to Jason. Um, so the people who are in red are the people who are actual like, participants enrolled in the study. The people who are in gray are people that we interacted with or who interacted with the system, but who are not people that we had weekly interviews with. Okay, so here it is. It's de it was deployed in the, these four homes. So uh, both the moms, uh, that's pictures A and C, decided to put it in the kids' rooms. Um, the dad from the first family put it in the living room where the cat was actually a big user of the system because it generated a lot of heat. And uh, uh, then uh, in the last family, uh, the dad put it sort of in the man den of the house, which was also a shrine to University of Georgia. And if any of you follow football, you all understand the irony there. Um, okay, so jumping right into the results. Um, how was the share table used? So I'm actually only going to talk about three of these ways today because I only have time, I think, for three of the ways. But feel free to ask me questions about the other stuff as well. Um, so we saw a lot of activities like drawing together and playing together. 
Um, we saw kind of more instrumental parenting activities as well, such as helping with homework, supporting learning by helping do like math problems on the table, for example. Um, and co-parenting, which is, um, co-parenting is that thing where your parents gang up on you to get you to do something. So we saw a lot of that, especially around like room cleaning activities, because now the remote parent could actually see the state of the local room, and so they could encourage the child to clean the room. Um, we saw sharing of physical items and um, something we label kind of sharing the moment. Um, for example, we got to see Christmas morning over the share table. Um, that was pretty exciting. And we saw emotional care activities as well. Um, so drawing together was probably the most popular activity for, for parents and children using the share table. Um, it provided a context for the conversation and it made the whole interaction sort of feel more like hanging out. So sometime around sort of minute two of talking to a child, like you run out of questions and it gets really awkward and so then you say, I love you, goodbye. Um, and so what happened instead with the share table is that at this point they switched to an activity so they would like draw together or something. And that, this provided enough of a context that they didn't have to say goodbye right away and usually came up with other things to talk about later. Um, so in this video you'll see Simon, he'll be drawing on this table and his dad, Matt, and stepbrother Jeffrey are on the other side so they're going to be watching and making comments and suggestions. So the video quality isn't great because it was so dark in the room um, and also his, he is anonymous so it, it's not you, his face is in fact blurry. Um, but I think you'll get the idea. Look what I drew. Yeah, what is that? Is that DNA? No, it's like, oh wait, no, it kind of does look like DNA. That's what I, that's what I said, it kind of looks like DNA. Except there's no ones. I need, just wait one second, it's almost done. Uh, oh, How do you red? I think you're going to be left-handed. Yeah, he's left-handed. Yeah, you keep, he keeps holding things with his left hand. Yeah, there you go. Here's the DNA. Wait. Okay, there's DNA. Yep. You like it? It's very good. Uh, so th the other thing about being a child in a divorced family is that you have two homes, and all your stuff is divided between two houses, including your mail. So mail was um, one of the big sort of physical artifacts that uh, parents and kids shared on the share table. So here David, the dad from the second family, puts a gaming magazine on the table so that uh, his son Taylor and his friend can look through it and chat about the games. Um, and this was kind of a time sensitive issue because Christmas was coming up so the dad really wanted some feedback about which games he might want to get for the kid for Christmas. Battlefield 3. Oh! That's it! Yeah. Do you have Modern Warfare 3 yet? Yes, sir. Why don't we ever see you online? I don't know. What's your gamer tag? You guys never added me. D see, I don't have you guys. You got some Mass Effect on here. Here, here. I, hang on. Let me write on here, and I can write down my gamer tag. Wait, if you write on here, can he see it? Yeah. He called you, my son. South Park. Okay, here's my gamer tag. So, I like the casual, yeah, of course you can see it. That was only like two years of work, but <laughs> the thing to note here is that um, Taylor, the kid, was able to introduce a friend from mom's house to his dad, a friend that his dad otherwise wouldn't have met. We also saw other introductions of the share table. So um, Simon, the kid from the first family, had members of his immediate family, people he considered his close family members who had never met. So his stepbrother, Jeffrey, had never met his stepdad, Rod, and that was an introduction that we saw happen over the share table. Otherwise, those two would have probably never gotten a chance to meet. Okay, but perhaps the most powerful thing about the share table was the opportunities that it provided for emotional care. So in this video, um, Taylor's on the other side, and he's sick. So Kelly, who's his mom, and Kennedy, his sister, are calling him. Um, so just note the use of metaphorical touch to create a feeling of comfort and closeness. Oh, you can't really see it, but... <coughs> She's holding his hand on the table. She's stroking. Do you see my hand holding onto your hand? Yes, I do. I love you, baby. Love you, too, Mom. Hi, Baba. There's my hand. Yeah, keep your hands and then we're going to do a family handshake, okay? Okay. Um, So this was kind of cool to see. And that's why I think this technology is really powerful in the home space. Okay, but for those of you who like numbers better, 
here's some concrete ways that the share table improved parent-child communication. So on average, the amount of time that the parents and child spend communicating remotely more than doubled for both families. And additionally, it was encouraging to see that the children were actually initiating some of these connections rather than always having the parent call. So I think this could have been even higher in family one, but because of the specific arrangements they had around using the share table, it wasn't. So the rule in the first family was that Simon had to go to his mom and ask her for permission to use the share table. Now, even if she said yes 100% of the time, just the fact that he had to go to her to ask for permission probably reduced the number of times that he did it. Um, in the second family, that wasn't the case. And um, in fact, the children initiated more than half of the conversations over the system. So um, I talked, uh, when I talked to Taylor, I asked him what was different about the share table. Um, and he said, it was more like, yeah, like you wanted to do it. Do they have any awareness? So I open it up. Do I have any awareness if my dad is even at the other end? Uh, it rings on the other side, and then it's just like a phone. So it rings, and then if it doesn't, nobody answers it in time, then it stops ringing, and it tells you like nobody's home or whatever. So, yeah, no, there's no awareness, and that's something that I think would be really important for this sort of system to succeed in the long run. Though the questions about what kind of awareness would be acceptable um, in a house that's not yours and the people who don't consider you their immediate family anymore—it's a different question. Um, so these are the results of the. Um, Effective Benefits and Costs Questionnaire, showing a comparison between the ratings of the previous technologies used by families versus the share table. So previously, the fa both, both of the families said that they had tried video conferencing, but neither of them had used it in the two weeks prior to the study, so in the two weeks of baseline data collection. So really, we have, to compare, we have the phone to compare to video conferencing. So um, overall, the share table introduced um, sort of uh, additional benefits. So particularly, it was more emotionally expressive. And that's kind of to be expected. There's video here rather than just the, just the audio. It had this greatest sense of presence and absence, which is um, when you feel close to a person, even outside of your actual immediate communication with them. So feeling close to the person, even outside of the phone call or the um, a share table session. Um, it also seemed to encourage more kind of engagement and playfulness. Uh, it did introduce additional threats to privacy, um, but it didn't seem to introduce any um, additional obligations or unmet expectations. Okay, so I really believe in looking at both worked and what didn't work when I value technology. So I think I already touched on all the points on the left. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what didn't work. So the number one technical problem with the share table was that the surface was simply not high enough resolution um, for all the tasks that the families wanted to do, especially the tasks with the 11-year-old who, at this point, read sort of regular font-sized books rather than picture books with big words and big pictures. Um, basically, uh, there was just not enough bandwidth to do all we wanted to do. Um, uh, sometimes the whole system was such a bandwidth hog that even the face-to-face -face video would get choppy, and that was problematic for the families. Um, th and this is despite the fact that we gave them uh, business class Comcast um, um, cl business class Comcast connectivity for the duration of the study, um, so the upload speeds are still a bit restrictive, and we couldn't get the kind of um, the kind of resolution that we wanted. Now, what would be really interesting to do is partner with, say, like one of the new gigabit cities that are popping up, where essentially the bandwidth wouldn't really be a problem, and see how this kind of technology could be used in that sort of space. Um, the other issue was privacy. So Nadia, the mom from the first family, had the most privacy concerns about the use of the system. In particular, she was really uncomfortable with feeling like she was invading her ex's privacy. Um, so he had it set up in a living room in his, in his house, and she really didn't like it that she could like see like his new wife walking around in the background. She just felt like she was intruding on the space. Um, additionally, she didn't like the speakerphone quality of the system. So like when you talk, everybody hears you, and you hear everybody. Um, and based on our feedback, we actually gave provided headphones for the second family to be able for them to be able to choose not to have that happen. They didn't use it, but um, I think in the first family, if we had provided it, the mom would have. Um, unfortunately, the share table did also introduce a new source of conflict for the families as they tried to figure out appropriate practices around its use. Um, in particular, um, in family one, um, Nadia sort of uh, the mom tightly controlled Matt's use of the share table. So he had to call ahead or text ahead any time he was going to use it, and she had to say yes ahead of time before he could use it. Um, and frequently, we saw in the videos that even the time, there were times when she said yes, when he would end up calling, she'd say, no, we're too busy right now. This is not a good time. And so this really reduced um, communication and led to frustration on his part. Yeah? Why, do you have any clarity about why they limited access that way, the parents, or that particular parent? Well, 
So I think she didn't, didn't want things to change. So before the way that the dad would communicate with the kid, the kid didn't have a phone of his own, right? So he would call the mom and she would pass the phone back to his kids. So she was the, the gateway through which he communicated. Um, and she kind of wanted things to stay the same. Um, I don't think she saw it as being problematic. She just saw it as like, oh, well, it's a courtesy for him to call me if he's going to use the share table later. Um, but I think it really did reduce the communication. Um, in family two, is actually the opposite. So uh, the dad, David, used the share table frequently and spontaneously. Um, and that was frustrating for the mom because it disrupted the routines in the house. So in one of the videos, we see him calling at 8 a.m. Um, just to say hi. And she's like, it's, it's 8 a.m. We're like having breakfast as a family. We need to you know, eat and get out the door. Why, you know, why, why, are you, why are you calling right now? Call at a regular time. Um, so I'd say that neither arrangement was really ideal. Um, but the strength of a communication technology like this one is that the custody arrangements that the families agree on with the help of an actual professional who can help them decide on these things, um, they can actually be encoded directly into the system. So if the parents decide that the appropriate practice is that the kid can call any time, but the parent can only call between 6 and 7 on a weeknight, then those can actually be encoded in the into the system and be enforced by the system itself. Um, now, of course, the hard thing is what do you do when you decide to change those rules? How do you negotiate them and how do you allow the system to be flexible enough to change those rules on the fly. Uh, lastly, we found that both of the moms complained that it wasn't really easy to find uninterrupted time to spend in front of the system. So they frequently used the weekends when the kids were away to catch up on things like running errands, to catch up on work. So they weren't at home in front of the system to be able to use it. Um, so as Nadia said, I can pick up the phone in a grocery store or wherever, uh, but I had to sit down in front of the share table to use it. And a lot of time that's not going to happen. So this really points to potential for future works on mobile versions of the system. And I think particularly powerful, um, perhaps asymmetric interfaces where the parents have a mobile version that they can use when they're on the go, but the child may have, still have something like the share table, which provides them with the opportunities of being able to show physical things and um, this kind of more natural system to use. OK, so the main point of my thesis is that communication technology is, a power, is powerful, and it can increase participation in a child's life from significant adults. Um, and I think that that really has much bigger potential than just communication in the home. Um, so let me just sketch out a scenario that touches on some of these ideas. So imagine that you walk into a uh, preschool classroom, and in the afternoon, the children get an opportunity for free play. Um, so a few of them wander over to the share tables in the corner of the classroom. The teacher turns on each station um, and with a remote and just flicks it to one of several connections that they had shared already or here had arranged, already arranged. Um, so these kids already know that Mr. Dapper from the local retirement village is going to be there to continue reading about the latest adventures of Captain Underpants. So the boys gather around the station. Um, they know that he can see them and hear them as well. Um, and they can point to the page and talk about the picture. So they kind of interrupt with their own stories. And uh, um, it's more of a conversation rather than just having a book read to them. Um, now, this table has actually been on all day. On the other side, um, the girl has been joining it in the lessons despite the fact that she has been at a local hospital for the past week. So now it's time to join in the play as well. Her and her friend have set up toy cups and basically are having a tea party together. Um, on the third table, the teacher has arranged the connection um, with a preschool for deaf children. So he's planning on connecting more with this group in the future, but for now he just wants to give the children some time to meet each other and play together informally. Um, so Kelly and Alex are on the other side, um, and they have already set up their board game. So with tokens that they say anybody can join in. Um, Nick looks a little unsure, but I think he's up for the adventure. So I'm really just using the share table as an example here. Um, I really go into each specific context and try to come up with a technology that actually addresses the needs of that context. Um, and so the specifics of the technology involved might be different. The bottom line is that there's lots of places where this kind of technology can be useful. Um, communication, healthcare. Um, education, um, all of these can really be, uh, can benefit from a technology like this. Okay, so if you're asleep, now's a good time to wake up because these are the three sentences that I, I want you to take away from this talk. So the first thing is that uh, the parent-child relationship is really a unique communication context. And um, the circumstances of the separation, you know, I investigated work separated families and divorced families, but there's other circumstances of the separation. These circumstances really influence the strategies that the uh, families use and the challenges that they face. Um, the second takeaway is that uh, looking at kind of the, both the benefits that a system provides and the costs, especially in terms of emotion, is one good way of considering and evaluating communication technologies in the home. Um, and the last one is that communication technologies can increase and more importantly change the nature of remote contact with children 
when you design them for, with this considerations for the specific context of the separation. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, did any of the, how long did these families have the devices for the tables? Uh, one month. And at the end of the, um, the experiment, what were their feelings that they expressed with regards to having had that technology and now going back to a time where they wouldn't have that technology? Yeah, I struggled with that a lot in the beginning. So, um, you know, we are giving them something really potentially good and then taking it away. So the way we framed the technology from the very beginning was that um, you know, it's just kind of like Mary Poppins. She helps the family and then has to fly away to help the next family. So in fact, at the end, we kind of had a, a mini design workshop with the families to ask them for advice they would give the next family who would use it um, to talk about how they could make the system better and just um, contribute in that way. Um, I also offered to work with the families to help them set up um, something that is commercially available and see if they could use that and get some of the benefits of the share table. So did, so, did they by and large miss it afterwards? Or would oh, oh my gosh, yes. No, I mean, I still, uh, the little girl from the second family is writing a book report about the share table, and I still get, like, emails from the mom being like, we're trying to do something else, like, let's try this other thing. In the first family, the dad really wanted to try mobile video conferencing, so um, he already had a phone that was enabled, so we actually, we actually gave uh, a phone to the kid to see if that would work. Um, but that ended up not working for them. Um, so I asked him if the mom would have a problem with kind of the kid walking around with video throughout the house, that that would be a privacy issue. And the dad was like, no, probably not. We usually do what's best for the kid. And uh, then when we communicated again two weeks later, I was like, so are you still using the video conferencing? And he said, well, I'd like to, but uh, she never keeps the phone charged. I don't know why. <laughs> so I think it was problematic, and um, that was one of the ways that... Um, they dealt with any it. other families that maybe go to, say, an iPad solution or something like that? So in the second family, I was really hopeful that they would um, do some sort of video conferencing, and the mom really wanted to, I think. The dad had a bad experience with video conferencing early on, and that kind of soured him to the whole thing. He was like, at one point, they tried to video conference with the grandparents, and he said it took them an hour and a half to set up a five, essentially what ended up being a five-minute conversation. Like, it was just, like, too much of a hassle. And... Uh, um, I've been working with the mom. I'm trying to basically get her to set up like remote access so she can set it up on both sides, essentially, so that the dad doesn't have to um, do all that. Like he was on the phone, she was like, "Click the button to the left," but on his computer, it's to the right, and you know that kind of thing. So that was um, problematic. But um, you know, the families wanted this. I, I mean, I got a lot of questions of when can we buy this, um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not doing a startup around it. But now I can just uh, you know point to Illumishare and say there's a better thing. We use this, you know, that kind of thing. What do you point? Oh, Illumishare? Oh, yeah, well. oh, yeah, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yes? Two questions. Uh, can you critique the, the American Airlines ad of the discussion between mother and daughter where it turns out the mother is flying on the plane? Oh. Uh, you, don't, you don't know it? No, I don't think I've seen it. I'm sorry, I haven't seen all the ads. Okay, but so, uh, <laughs> of course, it's ideal video conferencing. Right. And okay. the, the other is, what did, the, what did they say when you took the machines back? Yeah, well, I mean, mostly they, won't, they didn't want me to take them, but they, that was the agreement from the beginning, so they knew that that was going to have to happen. But, yeah, no, I haven't seen that ad. I might have to look it up. Yeah. So what do you think this says about, um, about communication in other situations, other parent-child parent, parent things, other child-child, um, and even adult-to-adult -adult communication? Uh, any specific aspect or just how this project in general reflected on it? Um, so I think one of the things that um, we forget as researchers is that sometimes a small barrier to communication can actually make a big difference. So we don't think about the login screen or the buddy list as a big, huge hurdle to jump through, but that was basically the difference between using it and not using it in this case. So the fact that you could just open the doors and they're there, that made a big difference. Um, and I th actually think that that's, that's the case in a lot of other um, areas, including the office, where I think if it was much easier to be like, one button, talk to your collaborator, rather than, wait, let me set this up over several machines, and why isn't this working, and all that stuff. Um, I think that's, that's what makes a difference between using and not using. I think I saw other questions, but yeah. Did, did the, um, after the fact, when they were using the mobile video conferencing, yeah. Did they explain why it didn't work? Was it the mom didn't keep the phone charged? And I think that was I, I, my my theory is that it was the privacy issue. So I thought a lot about 
mobile versions of the system, this idea of mobile. And um, some of the early feedback that I got from divorced families was that one of the things they really wanted to make sure was always there is an like, easy way to see is it on or is it off. Mm -hmm. And so if something is mobile, like if I have an iPad that's using doing my video conferencing or something, if it can be left behind the couch and it can be on and you don't know. I mean, kids leave stuff behind the couch all the time. I don't know why, but they do. And uh, like you're transmitting essentially like audio to the other house without realizing it. So that's one of the reasons that the share table was designed as a piece of furniture. So you kind of know how to n negotiate your way around a piece of furniture. You can easily glance and see how the doors are open or closed. And so you know whether it's on or off. Uh, wait, there's one more question there, and then I'll come back to you. Okay. So the uh, one thing I love about this, this kind of system and some of the earlier ones are the, just the very analog nature of the way that it works, which is, um, fits very nicely with some of your other projects. Um, and that it's, you know, you turn it on and anything you put under it yeah. is, by definition, transmitted in some sort of appropriate mm -hmm. manner. So it can be very used in very imaginative fashion. Fashion, so you can put all sorts of fun things under it. And what's, what are some of the creative things that you've seen? And you, you, you showed a couple things. Yeah, you know, I wish. So one of the pieces of feedback that we got from the parent is that the deployment wasn't long enough. He was like, after the study, I kept coming up with these cool things that we should have done that we didn't do. And oh my god, why didn't we try Fictionary? That would have been perfect for it. Um, we saw a couple of things, but. Uh, not like I think all the things that were like the idea of like holding hands the kids came up with that in the beginning in the first probably like first three or four videos that we have of parents using their system they're using it just they don't even pay attention to the tabletop like the little girl is trying to show her mom her painted nails and the mom is not even looking at them you know she's looking at the screen because she's only interacted with video conferencing before in, in one of the families in the first family the mom wouldn't even be in front of the system when she was using it. She was using it as a phone. She would stand off to the side and talk. So I think this is like an unfamiliar way of interacting for the families. And so they didn't really, I don't know if they didn't yet or they didn't, um, I can't say that, oh, this is like a, this awesome thing that they tried that we hadn't thought of before. In fact, I think the most creative use of the system we actually saw in the lab study deployment where mm -hmm. the, um, the kids, uh, the dad lay face up on the table and the kid traced his face. <laughs> so that was like really creative. Like I wouldn't have come up with that. Um, but yeah, most of the stuff we saw was, you know, pretty standard. So it was like, oh, like here's my book report. You can see like the grade I got on it. Here's a drawing, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, the kids were the only ones to sort of try it, like, um, like playing tag with their hands or like um, creating like... Uh, summary that, that they, they actually don't really use the system as you intended it? Or you no, they do use it, they use it as I intended it. In fact, I'd say too much as I intended it. I didn't see anything that was really surprising. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. So I didn't see like any use that was like, whoa, they like just tried something completely like weird that I wouldn't have thought of before. But probably because I've spent more time thinking about the system than is really reasonable for any person to think about anything. So <laughs> maybe I've already anticipated all the possible uses. But. One, two, three. Okay. Do you have any, any paper design for things which would fit in a backpack, in a in a handbag, in a under the uh, airline seat? Yeah, we had some, and I wish I could actually show you the sketches in such a way that you could see them. But um, it's um. Let's see if I can get back to the sketches page here. Um. So, oh, wow, no, you might, you might have to, I might just have to show it to you separately. But that was, that was one sort of right there. I mean, the, it kind of hinged on having a short throw projector, um, which we, all the, none of the parts of the system were stolen, but all of them were borrowed and begged. So um, we didn't, this is not really, um, um, we didn't have like short throw projectors or uh, that kind of stuff to actually play around with the idea of mobility more. Um, but we did think about it a lot and wish that it would happen. Yeah. Um, two and yeah. Um, was there any urge for an asynchronous communication component to this? So we actually built something in along those lines, um, and uh, so the idea. If you called the other table and nobody answered, what it did is it captured a still image of the tabletop and projected it on, on your side. So the idea is you could leave a, no, a quick note on the table, or you can just you know drop some pictures on the table, and the other person could see it even if you didn't answer the call. Um, nobody used it. And nobody used it, not because I don't think asynchronous is compelling, 
but because projectors take, took three minutes to start up. And so you called and nobody answered and you went away by the time the projector actually started up to show you your still image. So, um, but I, I think that there's a lot of potential for asynchronous, especially, you know, in this case, the families were basically an hour, an hour and a half drive away from each other. So the same time zone and still saw each other fairly frequently. I think things would be fairly different if we were talking about like different states, different countries, that kind of thing. Do you have data on how frequently they called and nobody answered? And uh, I called more the kids or the uh, I do have data on how many times they called, nobody answered, but I don't, I mean, I haven't like actually looked at that data. I, um, most of the time they knew when the other person was going to call, even the spontaneous stuff, like they already knew that the kids were going to be home that day or whatever, and so most of the calls were answered. So. And who initiated more? Who initiated more? Uh, the adults. Uh, I can show that. Hold on. So that I can actually show actual data on. Um, if you, if you can see it. So um, basically the starred ones are the people who initiated the conversations. And the first family was like dad all the way, basically. There was one conversation that the kid initiated with the share table. And this line here divides the pre-deployment versus the deployment. And then um, the mom initiated one conversation with the share table in the first family. In the second family, you actually see the kids initiating a lot. So Taylor is the boy, so he initiated. And Kennedy is the girl, she initiated a lot of the conversation. So the starred ones are the ones that initiated, and the green ones are the people who are participating in all. You mentioned earlier that, the, that in some families it created new opportunities for conflict. Right. Did, did it also, in some families, do the reverse, where it brought the parents closer in some way, or help maybe improve their relationship? Um, so it created opportunities for conflict, but um, so we gave this validated qu um, questionnaire uh, developed by psychologists that like measures different aspects of a relationship, and we looked at, okay, well, on this questionnaire, did they actually report more conflict or not? So while they report, reported specific cases of conflict about the share table, the family too did not have greater conflict overall. It's just that when they interact, they tend to have conflict, but it wasn't, they would have had conflict about something else if it wasn't about the share table. In the first family, there was actually greater conflict between the parents. As a result? Uh, I, I th well, at least the mom felt that her relationship with, the, uh, with her ex was less strong um, after the share table deployment. I don't know as a result of it, but. So there's certainly some, some causality there potentially. So, in the second family, they, where the kids bounce back and forth between the different houses, did both yeah. adults use it with yes. the kids remotely? Yes. Yeah, so both adults got a chance to use it with the kids remotely. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I really like this system. I think it's really compelling, to, to, especially to see the interleave of the physical play with the projection and the camera. One of the things that struck me is for output you had uh, audio and you had visual in the, in the form of projection. Did you think at all about doing anything um, with like physical output, like haptics or widgets that like one person could shake some, something over here and if they're holding on to it or like it would move or if they're holding on it they could feel what the other person was doing or having some built-in widgets that they could compose as a part of the different things they did? Yeah, we thought about it. We didn't do much more than think about it. Um, so it was interesting how much of that metaphorical physical touch they got even without actual touch. So I think sometimes maybe the symbol is just as powerful as the, the actual sense that's being stimulated. Um, I think it would be inter really interesting to build in things like warmth, for example, like, like heat stuff. Um, I think that's actually probably more indicative of closeness, of, like vibration. Um, but it would be cool to have some sort of actors. We thought about this idea of having like a um, like a playground for your toys where like things like if you spun your merry-go-round my merry-go-round would spin for my toys and like if you have a seesaw we could put toys on both sides and they would actually you know go like that but um, we didn't actually make that. For segmenting the human from the other objects on the table and portraying stuff about the people or, where, or what they were doing at the time did you think at all about using um, different imaging sources like a double camera? From segmenting, why, why, why are we segment, segmenting the human? If you're trying to determine what is the, what the person's moving around versus um, the image. Oh. So you have this like low latent, you have this thing where you have frames that are dropped mm -hmm. and you have stuff that you're trying to um, show in yeah, resolution. Yeah. No, I think there was a lot of things we could have done to be more sophisticated in terms of how we handled the video stuff, but we just, we didn't get around to it. I think, yeah, no, I think, I think there's a lot of opportunities for, you know, when it's moving around, still give high frame rate, but you don't need to have that good resolution, when it stops, that's when you upgrade the resolution. Um, but we didn't do that. Future work, how about that?
Okay. All right. I'd like to thank Lana. Thank you, everyone, for coming.